Our next speakers are Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens. Judy and Gar are New York Times and Los Angeles Times best-selling novelists as well as writing, producing team who have been honored by the Constellation Award for Outstanding Canadian Contribution of Science, Film, Fiction, and Television for creating the series, the sci-fi series, Primeval, New World. Their many genre credits include the Disney Imagineers to being writer-producers on Star Trek Enterprise. Please welcome Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens. Thank you very much. Hey, great. This is going to be interesting, one microphone. I will add on to what Newton was talking about. The science fiction writer Larry Niven once wrote an essay about what would happen if human beings could live to, oh, could live to uh, a thousand years. And he said, well, oh, and that's it. <laughs> and one of, one of the first things that would happen is no car would be allowed to travel faster than two miles an hour. All the buildings would be one floor. And uh, every, every corner would become round. No accidents. Well, we're, but we're about to change that now. Uh, I'm Judith Reeves Stevens. I'm Garfield Reeves Stevens. Together we're storytellers. And so, by way of introduction to our particular way of no, oh, right. for a way of introduction to our particular professional uh, viewpoint on life and death, uh, let us tell you a true story. There we go. Okay, the story begins July 4th, 2005. That's a NASA JPL mission deep impact to Comet Temple 1. The deep impact main spacecraft fired an impact door, 820 pounds, at the comet, and uh, uh, they hit, they, NASA actually hit the comet. They were traveling at 23,000 miles per hour relative to each other. So a fantastic piece of navigation, fantastic piece of engineering. And one of the key results that the scientists, the mission scientists, were eagerly awaiting was that first look to image the resulting crater size. And that was going to give them a great deal of information about the comet's composition. Uh, but right after capturing the first impact flash, uh, the first thing that the main spacecraft saw was a debris cloud. And they realized because of the comet's low gravity, it was going to take a long time for that to settle and for them to get a clear view of the crater. So the mission scientists then, faced with a delay, did what scientists often do. When there is a delay, they started a betting pool. And people were invited to put money into the pool along with their prediction of what the crater would eventually be. Was it five meters, 50 meters? Nobody knew. And now that next day on July the 5th, 2005, we were at JPL. And we were with our friend Brian Muirhead, who would go on to become the chief engineer of JPL. And we had written with Brian a book about going to Mars, about all the various explorations, both in science fiction and in, in real life. And we were having coffee with the principal investigator of the Deep Impact Emission, uh, Dr. Michael Ahern. And uh, he stopped by to say hi to Brian. We had never met the doctor, but we joined the conversation. And we had to ask, it's been a day now, do, we have, uh, do you have any idea, any clear sight of what the size of the crater is? And so Dr. Ahern looked at us, and he knew why we were asking. He said, why? Uh, what's your prediction in the crater size pool? And we said, Oh, we didn't think there was going to be a crater at all. Okay, our prediction was that the impactor was going to bounce off the side of the comet. Then a hatch was going to open on the comet. A giant plasma cannon was going to deploy. It was going to track and then vaporize the main spacecraft. And then the entire comet was going to change course to Earth on a mission, on mission of vengeance. vengeance. <laughs> Here we are at JPL, you know, one of the, the, the top centers of NASA. So Dr. Hearn, he tried to hide his panic. He wasn't sure, should he humor us? Should he call security? Should he try and save Brian? But uh, then Brian Muirhead just saved the day by one simple statement. He said, oh, no, no, it's OK. They're science fiction writers. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Dr. Hearn instantly relaxed. And because he knew what we were doing was we were doing our job. And for science fiction, that's that the heart of science fiction writing is thinking about what's the worst that could possibly happen. 
when you think about it, almost everybody in every job, you always have to plan for bad results. Uh, NASA, they build redundancy into all their spacecraft so that they have to think technologically, scientifically, what happens if that switch fails on Mars? What happens if that valve freeze, uh, freezes when the ship is orbiting Saturn? But being science fiction writers, we're not actually fettered by actual science or hampered by real knowledge. Uh, we don't just think about possible bad results, we think about the most awful bad results, the very worst thing. And so what better word, huh? There's, when it comes to artificial intelligence and transhumanism especially, science fiction writers have been thinking about this for decades. They've been thinking about it since a time when AI only existed in science fiction. And they've been thinking about it actually about the idea of artificial machines thinking since before there was even the term science fiction. So we're going to show you a glimpse of a couple of possible uh, futures that about AI that have been set out in science fiction, and uh, there are a few that even relate, interestingly enough, to transhumanism. And when we say possible, of course, we mean the very worst things. So here's one that everybody knows. The AI operating a gigantic spacecraft malfunctions and starts killing its crew, because that thing sort of happens. The question is why. Uh, the sequel, 2010, had a computer called Sal 9000, and Sal provided some sort of explanation about how Hal had been faced with a programming, co uh, programming conflict, couldn't quite get it together, but it's not important because the, the lesson of Hal is that complex AIs can malfunction in ways we can't predict and get, bring catastrophic results, and more importantly is that sufficiently complex AIs can interpret their code to decide to malfunction, and we won't have any idea what's going on. But now here's the, here's the opposite of AI not working. It's, it works perfectly, just not how we expected. Colossus the Forbin Project, if you haven't seen it, is a movie you should track down. Uh, it was released in 1970. It's based on a novel written in 66. And the main premise is simply that in order to remove any danger of human miscalculation from the launch of nuclear weapons, the United States turns over its arsenal to Guardian, a sophisticated AI computer has total control of all nuclear weapons, and its mission is to ensure peace. They switch Colossus on. The first thing it does is it detects Guardian. Guardian is the Russian AI system, which is controlling the Russian arsenal. And, the and then, inevitably, the two AIs communicate. They discover they have the same mission, and that's to ensure peace. And of course, the best way to ensure peace is to take control. The two AIs merge, and they become a single entity, and then they start giving the humans orders. And basically, they, anybody out there, a scientist, a politician who is deemed to be a threat to the existence of Guardian and Colossus is ordered to be executed on security cameras, the bodies left so the computers can be sure that people are dead. And if you don't carry out the orders of Colossus and Guardian, they will nuke a major city. So they've got the big hammer, and the bottom line is the world is at peace. The, uh, exactly the result that the AIs were intended to achieve, so they've worked perfectly. And in this story, the AI isn't a monster like Hal. Colossus decides it's like a god, and in time for bringing peace, we're going to end up loving it. But like Hal, and Colossus is just code being code. It's doing what it, the algorithm told it to do. Uh, it's, there's no need for awareness. And which brings us to Westworld. <laughs> Westworld, it's convoluted, but a fascinating story. It's on HBO, third season coming next year, about a world in which AI is achieving sentience or thinks it's achieving sentience. Since we have no way of meaningfully measuring sentience in another being, uh, it doesn't matter which of those two things happen, we get the same result. But consider this progression. Non-sentient HAL malfunctions and kills four astronauts. Non-sentient Colossus functions perfectly and ends up killing several tens of thousands. But the worst thing about the creation, or we'll say even the emergence, 
uh, of sentience, of machine sentience, is that it threatens to bring a death count that is many multitudes, many orders of uh, magnitude larger. Because when we, um, when machines behave as if they're sentient, then we're not just going to be dealing with technology run amok, where we have unleashed one of the most powerful forces known, and that is what Robert Ford says, evolution. And evolution is powered by conflict. So now we'll take a little sidetrack into three outcomes science fiction tells us might happen if we are actually crazy enough to create a species that is stronger, smarter, and better than we are. And that brings us to scenario one. Mm -hmm. And that's AI simply constrains us, and not through the threat of violence like Colossus, uh, but by undermining us. The Three Body Problem is a trilogy of novels originally written in Chinese. The first novel uh, is the first foreign language science fiction novel to win the Hugo Award, which is the Oscar of the science fiction world. And it's, a it's so filled with ideas. It's sprawling. It's huge. It's great. The, the basic story is that aliens who live on a world of chaotic conditions because they are in unpredictable orbit of three suns find out about Earth one sun, very peaceful, they decide that's where we should be living. They launch a giant invasion force towards our planet. The idea, eradicate all humans, take over the world for themselves. So that's pretty basic science fiction. But what's different in this story is humans know the invasion force is on the way. And there's scientific rigor in the story because we also know the aliens can't travel much faster than four, the 10% the speed of light. So it's gonna be 450 years before they get here but the aliens aren't going to let us use that time to prepare our defenses. This is one of the amazing scientific ideas in the book is the aliens have uh, super science and they use it to create very sophisticated AIs that they unleash upon our world. And what these AIs do is they don't go around killing anybody. They, well, I guess they kill one person. But what they do, what they do is they take over our scientific instruments. They take over our astronomy satellites. They take over our particle colliders. The idea being that any experiment we run, any experiment we run is going to give a completely randomized results. I jumped us. Oh, you jumped us? I jumped okay. us the screen. Oh. Can you go back to the screen? There we go. Yeah. And so the aliens have stopped us cold simply by limiting our ability to gather new scientific knowledge. So we're trapped in a box of our own making, and the very patient aliens are on the way. Sometimes, though, the AIs take a more direct approach. Uh, in the Matrix movies, they... This brings us to scenario two. They decide to keep us around for a while for their own purposes. We go from being the planet's dominant species to being cattle. And, uh, or as they say in the Matrix, copper tops, because somehow, whoop. Is that, is that the music? Okay, <laughs> and we will end now, or we will jump ahead? We will jump ahead. Okay, we'll just oh. run through. This scenario three is the worst one of all, of course, where the machines have no use for us. And we then have scenario four is the sidetrack, because what happens if the machines don't destroy us, but we actually merge together and evolution comes in, and this is where we say, the future looks a bit fuzzy because we come to uh, a threshold and we say, the Borg, are they human? Are they transhuman? Are we getting to a point where we are creating a divide where we can say to the one side, that's transhuman, the other side, that is other than human, and what if we actually have created two species that then, driven by evolution, compete? But sometimes we have to remember that in the real life, the worst doesn't happen. The crater was 150 meters. We lost the pool. But that's OK. That's cool. Because there's a type of science fiction we like to write also that invites us to think about the worst thing that's happened, but also look at it in a different light. And the idea there is that maybe sometimes the best things happen if we work hard enough at it. And maybe and, that's how we change. And as the founder of Vulcan Logic says, I'm pleased to see that we have differences. May we together become greater than the sum of both of us. Uh, and they have to 